for getting started. Um, that was close enough. Uh, perhaps my name is Dan Lawrence. Um, everybody should be able to see my screen and the webcam right now. Uh, so we can come in and get started. Uh, we'll give people one more minute or so since it still says 3.59 here for me. Oh, there we go. All right. Four o'clock, we can get started. Uh, so thanks for listening to the last talk of the day, uh, my talk on open source supply chain security. Uh, so my name is Dan Lawrence, um, doing this session live from quarantine here in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm a software engineering lead at Google, um, and I've been working in open source for a long time now. Um, I've been involved in the cloud and containers um, open source space for a while, but before that, I've also been doing open source. So over close to about a decade now. So open source security and open source supply chain security is a topic um, that's near and dear to my heart and really keeps me up at night with some of these terrifying um, attacks. Uh, so recently in open source, I've been kind of working in the Tecton continuous delivery open source project. I helped start that and I'm still a maintainer and lead today. But I'm also working on a larger industry wide effort to help secure the open source supply chain, uh, both of which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. Um, I don't know about everyone here, but this is one of my first virtual events. Um, so I'm hoping to have a little bit of fun, trying to make it interactive. Um, we're going to be doing a couple of quizzes and polls later on where I can ask you some questions and I want to see your answers um, in the chat in the Discord. So um, there's, everybody should see the Discord channel, track two in the clouds. Um, I'll just type there. Um, and once we get to that part, I want everybody to type their answers. Um, and please try to it's interactive and be honest. This is a judgment for the talk. Cool. Okay. All right. Let's jump in. Um, so, open source is under attack. I'm going to start by covering the state of open source and supply chain security. Um, unfortunately, it's not good today. We are under attack. I'm going to cover uh, how it's under attack, by who, and some things you can do to protect yourself today. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some of the larger efforts going on to help solve this as an industry and how you can get involved to help out if you're interested. Let's start with the problem with open source. I don't want to bash open source. Open source is amazing. Spend most of my career using and building it. I'm sure everyone else here interacts with it every single day. Uh, but we do need to face the facts. Having a problem with open source and open source security is not a solution, and it's not how we're going to solve them. I'm going to start off here with one of the most terrifying and pressing problems today. Um, and if you're not terrified by the time this section is over, um, hopefully you can rewatch the recording and keep doing that until you do get terrified. All right, let's start out here with the first quiz. Um, I don't know if everybody here remembers what this is, um, but this was a USB flash drive um, before Dropbox and Google Drive and Cloud Storage. This is how people actually used to transfer files between. Um, so, first question in the quiz, hopefully people are listening in the Discord. Um, if you found one of these on the street, would you pick it up and plug it into your personal laptop? Got one answer here. <laughs> Zero, no. No on the USB. All right, good. Um, okay, so it so sounds like a little bit of a silly question, but let's uh, go a little bit farther with this. If you found one of these outside of your office, uh, would you pick this up and take it into your office and plug it into a work computer? No. Um, okay, even less so. Good. Start to see where this is going. Okay, so let's pretend you work in a Data center, not even allowed in the door. So let's pretend you work in a production data center. You have the server maintenance in that data center. And you found one of these on a sidewalk outside there. You could take it and plug it into the server uh, running your databases. Hopefully, people start to see where this is going. And hopefully, people have received some kind of training on this from their company on what to do so everybody isn't you know, these answers on the fly. Um, this sounds like a silly uh, question, but the reason this has been hammered into everybody so strongly by our security teams and our training departments is because this is a real type of attack. Um, this has been used dozens and dozens of times, uh, even at the international level. Um, if anybody remembers the Stuxnet worm, uh, used to disrupt uranium enrichment, 
Um, that attack was allegedly carried out by dropping thumb drives near facilities in Iran to breach an air gap. Um, I even had a little bit of a run-in with this once. Uh, and learned how seriously my company takes this type of threat. Um, I was living in San Francisco back at the time. Getting some people in chat saying they can't see the presentation. Can anyone see it? Okay, so some people can. All right. Um, sounds like it's working for some people. Okay. Uh, all right. Sounds like there have been some intermittent problems. I'll continue. Hopefully, people can get that resolved. Um, yeah, so I was living in San Francisco in 2013, and a friend of mine had just gotten a brand new drone. Uh, we went to fly it near the Bay Bridge uh, in Barcadero in San Francisco. Drone technology was a little bit new at the time. He didn't really know how to fly it that well, so he got a little bit out of control with the drone and ended up crashing into a building across the street. Um, it landed on a balcony of that building. If anybody's kind of familiar with that area, the Google office where I worked is right there. Um, I started looking and realized that he crashed the drone into my office. So I went in, um, got my badge, and went in to look for the drone. Uh, but it turned out our security team had already confiscated the drone. I explained what had happened, um, and they agreed to give the drone back to my friend, but they were still a little bit worried he was using it to take pictures or spy on the office. So they wouldn't give it to him. Uh, they wouldn't give him the drone back unless he showed them that he wasn't taking photos. Uh, but and this is the part that really impressed me, taught me how uh, seriously people take attacks like this, is that they wouldn't plug his SD card into their own computer. That's how scared they were of this. So I made him go home and get his own laptop, plug that in and show them the pictures on it. Um, that would have been a kind of crazy attack vector, but don't plug anything you don't trust into your computer is the overall message, no matter how you find it. That's how scary this is. It's how scary it should be. So what does any of this have to do with uh, open source security. What do drones and USB drives and uranium enrichment have to be open source today? All right, so time for the next quiz back to the chat. Um, what did we learn and what can we take away from these other examples? What is the difference between plugging one of these USB flash drives you might find on a sidewalk into your laptop and typing this command npm install express? So your npm is that network package man. What is the difference between these two? People a minute to type these answers. See some people are thinking about it. Trust in the contents of the files. Nothing. Not as much as you hope, but a little bit of social proof. Okay, um, so here's my answer. Um, I think most people are on track a little bit. Um, my answer is only one of them runs as a root in production. When you plug a flash drive into your laptop, it's kind of limited to that laptop. But if you're typing, if you have install express and packaging that up into an app that gets deployed to production, it's going to eventually run with a whole bunch more privileges. Um, people are mostly on track, though. Uh, in general, we rely on social proof and hopefully. Uh, assuming other people have looked at those files and trust them a little bit. And, uh, hopefully nothing bad happens when we take this code that we've never seen before and run it on our computers or worse, our data centers. Um, I don't really want to pick on NPM here. This is a problem with package manager, pretty much an open source today. Um, so let's jump and do another bit of a demo with a couple more quizzes. So now I will try to tab away from presentation. And cool, people should see my uh, my ID here. So uh, this is a demo of Go, uh, the Go programming language that I use for most of my program development today. And it suffers from most of these same problems. So I'm going to show an example here um, of how a supply chain attack might get carried out and how hard it is to find. Uh, this is a little toy uh, project. It's called Numbers. Um, it tells you whether or not a number uh, tells you whether a number is even or odd. So you can see how this works here. Um, go run and go to three. You can see cool. Three is odd. Got it four. Four is even. And we can see the implementation. Um, this takes the number uh, as input and it uses this uh, percent sign, which is the modulo operator, um, to tell if it's even or odd. 
Um, this might be a little bit unfamiliar to you um, and, and my colleagues. Let me switch over here. Um, here's a GitHub repo. Decided that the module operator was hard to maintain. So I got this pull request sent um, to switch from using that custom logic to using an open source library here. Okay. This is what the pull request looks like coming into my package. Um, so changes to our Go module definitions um, and import statement. And then it switches over here. Cool. So this package is called odd and has a function uh, to tell us something is even or odd. Um, if I wasn't being that um, conscientious, I might just merge this and be on with my day. But let's pretend I know about open source supply chain impacts and I want to take a look here and uh, see what's in this code before I merge it. I will take this um, and open this up on GitHub. It's odd. Well, so we can see all the source code here. Um, it's got some tests, which is awesome. Um, I didn't have tests before. Uh, we can check out the implementation here. Uh, nothing. Uh, too tricky. Um, just calling another library is even. Um, and now, if I want to be extra, extra careful, we can even take a look at the is even library here. Um, also, tests. Wait, we're being way more careful than 99% of open source maintainers probably would be. We still don't see any problems. So let's uh, take this one extra step. So let's actually check out that branch. And run it and see what happens. Go check how to use library. Now it's the same thing. Go run take.go for. Uh oh. Um, let's see here it's printing starting a crypto miner. Uh, so even though I looked at all of that code, somehow a crypto miner got pulled in. How did that happen? Does anyone have any guesses in the chat before I show how this slipped in and then uh, how you might help detect this and prevent it? Any crypto code and all those gate commits I looked through. Where did that come from? Overloading synonyms and code constraints with URLs and imported as a dependency. Um, I assume by overloaded synonyms, we're talking about one of those attacks where someone uses Unicode characters. Um, that's another important one. That's not what I did here. Important is a dependency. Technically, the only two that got pulled in were even and odd. It is because it was hidden in a different version of even dependency. So I can show how you might have caught this. Uh, there are two main ways. Uh, one is if we just actually go back and look through here, we can see that we're using this specific version of the is even library. So when I did my spot check, I only looked at the top two, but it was hidden all. So we can take that commit. Let's have it go. And we can see that that one added a file to do a bunch of crypto mining. Thankfully, it left this log statement in so we were able to detect it. Um, it was then deleted right after that. So if you just look through the current state of the Git repository, you might never see these things. To figure out what's actually getting merged here, um, I generally recommend vendor dependencies. So you can do go mod vendor. Then instead of just the uh, descriptors here or the URLs that are hard to track down and follow, um, it actually pulls the code in that's going to get used. So we can go through here and see the util file, start crypto. So that actually checks these dependencies in your repo. So if we did that, we can add. And Library. And then if we go back to GitHub and review our pull request, even though GitHub hides these diffs by default, if we, um, they're at least now part of it. So if we actually open up all these files, we would see crypto miner in here. And that would make it a lot easier to catch. All right, so I will jump back to presentation. Uh, so I just showed Go modules. I talked about NPM as well. Um, this is a problem with every package manager. Like I said, 
Um, Go modules aren't all bad. They do have some cool security features, um, but they're not perfect. Uh, code review only shows the dependency metadata unless you're using vendoring. That makes it hard to detect these things. Um, Go uh, and the Go team want a module proxy to store code um, in an intermediate location. We were able to find that in a GitHub repository because the commit was preserved. Um, if I had deleted the commit in that repository, it would have been even harder to find by going through there. I would have looked at the Go module proxy directly and it stores things. Um, and with Go and the new Go package management ecosystem, the number of dependencies is growing pretty rapidly. Um, it's hard to take the time to review each line in a large project, but it doesn't make it uh, so you can skip. You're still taking arbitrary code or picking up, basically picking up flash drives from the sidewalk and plugging them in every time you install a dependency that you didn't look at. Um, so to sum up this problem, um, you all understand that software um, and code review throughout the software development process is important. Most people will know to take that seriously when working on it. Uh, but we've somehow let open source slip through the cracks. Um, in general, we hope that through social trust and having many eyes on the problem, that stuff like this will get caught before it affects us. Uh, but that's not always true. These attacks are becoming more and more common, so the chances of getting caught by one is increasing over time. Basically, when everybody is responsible for reviewing open source software, in many cases, no one is responsible and no one is actually doing it. Um, I showed how to review the source code for Go, um, and it's easier than a lot of languages uh, because dependencies and Go modules are just source code. Imagine what that might look like for a language that packages uh, built artifacts like Java um, or even Python or some of the other interpreted languages for the transformation step between your repository source code and the final thing you download and install. Um, let's take a look at Python and what it takes to trace something like this back for a popular Python module. So I'm going to jump back to demo. Um, we are going to start out with the requests library in Python. Grab the URL. Um, if anybody has used Python for a while, um, you're probably familiar with the requests library. This is how most um, HTTP requests are made in Python. This is one of the most popular libraries. Um, so if we go to the Python package index and you type pip install requests, this is roughly what you're going to get. Um, we can look through here. This tells us that the source code for requests is here on GitHub. Click over to that to see the source code. Um, but if we download this through pip, we're not actually going to get it from GitHub. We're going to get this file. Um, how do we know that what's in this file came from this GitHub repository? Um, well, the short answer is that we really don't. We're trusting the maintainers of this to faithfully upload uh, the built artifact from this GitHub repository over to the Python package index. Um, requests um, is huge and popular, uh, so we can kind have of pretty good faith that that's what's happening. Um, if you look inside this repo, um, make file, um, you can see that they actually have a script here um, to publish a release. Um, it installs another dependency, um, which you kind of have an adversarial to hat on. Uh, you might get a little suspicious, but it's installing something called Twine. Um, of running some build commands using Twine to upload that. So if you were able to inject some code into Twine, you actually have a chance to modify this code before it gets uploaded. Um, how do we know that this is what the maintainer actually ran, though? We have no idea. But since it's Python, we can still kind of do some basic verification um, and download and compare. So what would it look like to actually have to do something like that with Python? Got a couple scripts here, so I don't have to remember all this bash five as I go. Um, but we can download the source code from GitHub, um, your Git clone, and check out the specific version we looked at, open that up. Um, and then we're also going to download the published wheel, which is what a Python artifact is called, um, and explore those. And then we can combine both of these and give the two directors. So for this one, if we do it, uh, hopefully we should see nothing um, too drastically different. Download the wheel, download the source code, um, and then the diff start. Okay, so there actually are uh, some files that are only in the Git repository. Let's look like kind of boilerplate, the document directory, some CI settings and stuff like that that you don't necessarily need. Um, the main meat of this is the same uh, overall request directory. 
Um, so it is possible to verify these kind of things in Python and other interpreted languages. Uh, but now imagine what it would look like to actually do this every single time you install the package um, and do this. Or for a language like Java, where you just get the package up into jars, which are a lot harder to do those and inspect. How many people out there are actually doing this stuff for every package they install? And this isn't even really a full demo. I did this for the request package, but if you actually type to install requests, you're going to get probably a dozen or so packages the request depends on. Um, so taking the time to follow all of those packages back to the repositories of the exact versions that they got downloaded from and comparing file by file isn't something most people are going to take the time to do realistically. You know each one of those is a potential attack vector into your application. Let's try to jump back here to do my presentation. So, so these are all simple applications that just had a couple of dependencies. Um, even the request itself only has a couple of dependencies um, to go from. Uh, but one of the projects that I spent a lot of time working on, and most people um, in the cloud container space have probably heard over use is Kubernetes. One of the most active projects on GitHub. This right here is terrifying monstrosity of a chart on the left. It's a snapshot of the dependency graph of the Kubernetes project taken a few months ago. Uh, Kubernetes is built in a go, like I showed before, and it does make use of vendors. Changes to dependencies get checked in to the Kubernetes uh, source code management system. Um, you can see how very deep and nested all of this gets um, in a large project. Um, but even with the Kubernetes, I mean, each one of these dependencies has a whole bunch of other dependencies, and uh, it takes a lot of time to start to review these things. Um, some of these are coming from trustworthy sources, and we don't need to take as close a look at the stuff here coming from Microsoft. Um, this is just a snapshot of a couple of things in the Kubernetes dependency and C tree. I'm not trying to pick on these or call them out, but there's something from a trustworthy source like Microsoft, but then um, there's a whole bunch of basically just smaller personal GitHub repositories. Um, that are now being imported into the Kubernetes tree to serve as attack points. Think about how long it would take uh, if you just started working on um, one of these projects to get um, admin or maintenance privileges on the repository for you to put in any code you want um, and wait long enough for the update to be picked up and pulled into upstream dependencies um, and make it into larger, larger projects. It's another small problem, though. Um, even if we do we say we trust a couple of these. Um, organizations or large projects, uh, we have no way to actually guarantee that this came from Microsoft. If you're making use of one of those URL swatting or typo swatting things, is one of those O's actually one of those Unicode characters that looks like one? Um, there's no kind of public key or sign infrastructure for us to know that these are coming from the people we think they are. If you uh, start to get excited um, and think about a uh, red team scenario here, if you just had a couple months, how long would it take you to get maintenance privileges on something like this? You can merge code and get malicious code into clusters all over the world. Um, this isn't really scalable today. Um, we're doing and preventing these things. So new tools, new practices, and new systems to help solve this in a scalable way across the industry. And now I'm going to talk about a little bit of history and why now. Um, open source has been around for decades and decades and decades. Um, so why are we only worrying about this today when people have been copying around code and using it um, for so long? Um, your um, overall kind of history of this, uh, this attack has been known about since at least 1984. Uh, there was a paper published called Reflections on Trusting Trust um, that shows the turtles all the way down the problem here. Even if you trust all the source code that's coming in, you also have to trust all of the tools involved. And this paper showed an even scarier scenario where somebody uh, they could modify a compiler uh, that was used to build source code and could insert backdoors in every program that that compiler built. Um, and there's some really funny stuff in there where they insert uh, backdoors into the disassemblers and everything too. So even if you use the disassemblers to look for these backdoors, those disassemblers have been compromised, so they hide the vulnerabilities. Um, so it's kind of troubles all the way down. If you don't know how the tools you use were built um, or the tools that built those tools. Um, it's uh, kind of a nightmare scenario. Uh, so people have known about these attacks forever. They have started to accelerate, though, um, which is the worrying part. Um, in 2006, 
got pretty worried and made a whole bunch of security improvements when a bunch of Debian um, and Red Hat package repositories were poisoned. And people were able to insert malicious packages right into the places that everyone installs in their security tools and compilers from. Um, 2010, there's a Stuxnet worm I mentioned before used to disrupt um, an international scale. Um, some similar attacks have happened on kernel.org with Linux kernel development stored um, and uh, even uh, in the new package management space. Um, I like to call out the Docker 123321 attack. Um, it didn't have a uh, huge impact, but it is pretty scary when you think about what happened. Um, when Docker was first gaining momentum, and Docker Hub was an open source uh, repository for container images, uh, a group of people, um, I don't think they were ever really caught, started publishing a whole bunch of useful container images, things with uh, MySQL, Tomcat, um, and some crypto uh, container images were published, um, and they did a good job of maintaining them and keeping them up to date for um, years. And people started using stuff in Docker 123331. Then eventually, um, they inserted crypto mining into these uh, container images slowly over time shows that if you're patient um, and actually do useful work, people will build on you and depend on you the way open source is supposed to happen. Um, and then you can reach that trust by using that platform you built to um, inject ransomware or crypto mining or all sorts of terrible things. Um, there have been much other recently, uh, like the Webmin attack. Um, that one was a build server compromise. So the CI system that was used to publish Webmin, um, a popular Remote administration tool for servers was compromised. So every release had some code injected into it to add a backdoor to a server administration tool. Um, and that was in the wild for a while. When you start thinking about an open source supply chain, um, it's every piece of the way that this stuff gets delivered to you. It's not just the source code, it's also the build tools and build system. And every one of those is an attack vector. It's really exciting if you've got a red team hat on, uh, really scary for anyone else. Um, some more numbers here just to show the scale of this problem. Um, 2020 has been a year full of pretty bad news, and I hate to add fuel to the fire here and scare people anymore, but uh, supply chain attacks this year aren't looking any better than everything else. Um, there are 11 million developers running VM commands each month, grabbing packages from the internet and installing them. Um, there's been an 80% increase in supply chain attacks in 2019. 2020 uh, isn't over yet, but a similar increase so far. Pretty much everyone is using open source software, whether or not you know you are. 97% um, of companies are using it in some form. Uh, so pretty much everyone needs to be worried about this problem. Um, and then there is the scale of code sharing with things like GitHub and Awesome Package Managers comes more and more using other people's code. Um, the average node project has 86 dependencies. Um, that's just across all GitHub, so that's small and large. Uh, many projects I've looked at have one or two orders of magnitude more than that getting pulled in. Every time you add something, you need to think about the uh, different attack vectors here um, opening up for people into your code. By any interpretation here, uh, this is serious and getting even worse. But again, why now? Um, why are people only doing this now and why is it rising? Oh, the cost per hack in um, the rest of software is increasing. Um, all of us here that are trying to protect systems are doing our job. We're closing all the other doors. People have stopped um, leaving servers just open to the internet. We're all using HTTPS. Um, most of the other common entry points are getting uh, tougher. So attackers will naturally find the easiest way in. Um, the rise of open source. Um, at this point, it's probably the easiest place to inject things. Um, not everyone uses, uh, not all software is open source, and you have to technically have to worry about these type of vulnerabilities coming in from paid vendors, uh, but that's much harder than open source, so that's the easiest way to for some packages. All right, so now that the scary part is over, um, everyone can relax. I'm going to start talking about some reassuring things, hopefully. Um, if you want to kind of jump out of this and start looking at every line of vendor dependency code in your application, I completely understand. You don't have to listen to the rest of this. Um, hopefully, this will be recorded and you can watch the rest later. Um, but now comes the optimistic, hopeful part um, how you can protect yourself today and then what we're doing to make this um, harder at an industry level. 
how to protect yourself. Um, thankfully, nothing here is too complicated. Um, you just need to start protecting your supply chain first. You need to lock down your own repositories. Some basic stuff like enabling and requiring two factor authentication for every one of your contributors. Even if someone you know, an employee at your company or uh, another open source maintainer that you trust on the sending you code, if they're not using two factor authentication, they could have been compromised. Um, so you need to start requiring everyone to adopt basic security standards. Require everything to go through code review and actually take the time to review the code that's coming in, whether it's yours or not. Um, this one is especially this kind of the pain one. Reduce your dependencies. Uh, dependencies are great, and it's easy to get stuff done quickly, uh, but you need to think about every dependency as an attack point. Evaluate if you really need them all. We're using something great, but then hundreds of non great uh, second level dependencies, that's a problem. Uh, take that into account as you're evaluating what to build on. Then uh, the even tougher part. Um, it's not tough from a complexity perspective. It's tough because it's painful and time consuming. But you need to audit your dependencies. Um, track updates to them, but you need to review these updates just like first party code. Uh, you need to go through them, everything you're using. Um, this isn't uh, only about people inserting malicious code. Uh, dependencies have bugs too. Sometimes those bugs need to vulnerabilities to get reported to CDEs. Um, if you're not checking uh, your dependencies in CDE databases, um, then you have a bunch of different supply chain problems. And the final piece, um, making your CI CD pipeline observable. So this is not so much about protection, but it's about uh, mitigation after the fact. Um, if you aren't logging every single version and every single git shot and every commit um, and every digest of every artifact you're using, um, then if something like this does happen, you're gonna have a much harder time figuring out how uh, compromised you got. Um, the stuff above this is about trying to prevent yourself from having a bad day. This bottom one is about uh, making that bad day not turn into a bad month if it does happen. If your CICD system uh, keeps all of these logs, and then you can track down what versions of your dependencies are in production um, and make it easier on yourself later. All right, so I'm talking about uh, some stuff that's going on uh, to help make these attacks harder and uh, them at and industry level. Um, identity and software is a big one. Um, today, uh, it's pretty common to sign J commits. If you're using GitHub, you get a little badge like I showed here at the top right saying your commit has been verified, um, which is great. It looks like it's secure. Uh, but all that really says is that someone generated a J key pair and signed that commit. It doesn't tell you who did that, um, just as someone did. Uh, we need to get beyond just these signatures. Uh, without another source of trust for uh, PKI, for like key infrastructure, um, that verified badge doesn't really mean anything. Um, for maintainers of open source projects, we need ways for them to share their um, identity and the public keys that they mean to be using. Um, this will help prevent attacks where people spoof or pretend to be other people. But it will also make it easier for maintainers to know whether or not a contribution coming into an open source project is coming from someone they trust or not. Uh, since these people are overburdened and barely have time to review the code and we're dealing with every day, these tools make it easier for them to know how closely they have to take looks at stuff like this. Um, what some of the work that's going on here, um, signing commits isn't terribly hard today, but there's a bunch of work going on in the open source Git project itself to make it easier to sign commits. Uh, today, you have to use GPG, which is kind of clunky to generate key pairs. Um, but everybody already has SSH keys set up um, and push to GitHub, hopefully. Um, and uh, there's some work we got to make it possible to sign your new commits with these SSH keys instead of having to manage a whole separate set of key pairs. Um, two factor auth everywhere. Um, thankfully, this is finally reaching ubiquity across the industry. Almost every service supports two factor auth. Um, but it's hard to check to see if your contributors or other projects that you're using are using two factor auth. You can require it on your own project, uh, but you can't tell if you're depending on something that does not require it. Um, if you're pulling in dependencies from people, even if you trust them and they're not using two factor off, um, then that's a problem. You need to make this more visible and kind of uh, shame the projects of people that aren't using two factor off to setting up this basic security protection. 
um, and then like I talked about uh, just a minute ago, um, better PKI infrastructure so that all known people can share the public keys that they do their work on them, so we can have more trust in the work that's being assigned to these keys. Moving beyond just that kind of point, this verified symbol that doesn't really give us much information. So uh, the next step up from identity and who is typing things at their keyboard. Um, we also have to start uh, finding out better ways to trust the source code that we're using, depending on. Um, if you take source code in a binary form, um, you have very few tools to figure out what code uh, went into that binary and what tools produced it. There's some projects that have to standardize uh, software bill of materials. Um, SBOM is Acronym, I think, to search for there, software bill of materials, um, which will allow people to distribute executables and binaries to describe all the things that went into those. So, if you download a random program, you can see exactly where it came from in a trusted way. Um, and this is coming from uh, hopefully instrumented build systems that will automatically generate these standard formats once they get it written on. Um, then, tying that source code back, uh, once you can go from a binary to source code. That source code back to the identity of the contributor. That's the federated strong identity programs we talked about before. Um, and then just looking uh, at source code to figure out if it is secure. We have security audits. Um, many large open source projects have done them, uh, but they're expensive and hard. Uh, they don't do them often enough. Projects might get one audit every two or three years. Um, we need to come up with ways as an industry to contribute funding. Um, to these projects that we're all depending on that are being uh, don't have uh, enough attention to pay to them. How do we fund auditing in a more scalable way for critical projects? Um, once we have really good data showing which kids are going in and who the contributors are for projects, we can start to do more advanced things. It sounds like a data problem um, because it is. We just don't have anomaly detection. There have been a couple of attacks where uh, somebody just abandoned a package because they got busy with their job or personal life and handed it over to another group of maintainers uh, that were willing to take it on. Um, if you were looking at the commits, you might see a huge change in activity there. To find that product, it's something you need to take a closer look at. Um, and then, in addition to auditing, um, you can start to do things like crowdsource reviews. So, if you're on a project with hundreds of thousands of lines of dependencies, um, your company and you want to spend the time reviewing those. Hopefully, uh, we can kind of crowdsource that so everyone out there isn't reviewing the same set of uh, lines of code. We can build up a little bit of trust with each other um, and flag things that we've all read to make sure that the many eyes on every line of open source is actually true. We get a few more um, eyes on each one. Um, after the source code course, there is the build process. Uh, we talked about the Reflections on trust and trust waiver. Um, and the demo I showed with the requests library. Um, we need CI and build systems uh, to log your activity and make this publicly viewable so that everyone can trust it. I imagine if we could actually just see in a way in a secure, accessible format exactly which commands got run to transform that request's Git repository to the published package in Python. And we wouldn't necessarily have to audit it every single time. Uh, we just see the scripts that were happening, um, trust those scripts, and uh, trust that the CI system will be run correctly. Um, the tool chain uh, vulnerabilities can also come in um, the tool chain level. Once in a while, there's a bug found, and then go compile the results in uh, binary still with it being subject to DOS attacks, for example. Um, if you don't know the tool chain that was used to build your own application, then you don't know if you're uh, subject to those kind of things. Again, we need ways to uh, securely log the exact versions of the tool chains that were used. Then the final piece, the artifact manager itself. None of this matters if somebody can just upload artifacts directly to that or modify the artifacts that have been um, uploaded already. Um, knowing who did that, and often it's a different group of people from the maintainers on Git. Uh, it's a great start here. Um, knowing whether or not updates are available to things to fix known vulnerabilities. That's another huge uh, attack factor that uh, people rarely consider. If some new CDs are out there in a while and trick somebody into not updating, it's, uh, you can point them at an out of date package manager or something like that, and you can keep them vulnerable and exploit that later. 
Um, there are actually some protocols designed to help uh, flag stuff like this. So if you know updates are supposed to be available and you're not receiving them, um, that can work. And then tampering, of course, the source signatures uh, do come in, which everybody has some experience with already. Um, but uh, organizations um, should be signing their artifacts. Unfortunately, not every package manager that supports this. Um, there is improvement happening to almost every one of these pieces, um, especially package managers. This is kind of a, a time for a whole bunch of improvements here. We talked about some of the really cool stuff, um, some, of, some of the parts that make Go modules hard to work with securely, but they do have some cool improvements. Uh, the version selection algorithm in Go modules um, is designed to help prevent you from upgrading accidentally um, you know, when you upgrade uh, when you need to. And the Go team runs a hit module proxy server and actually publishes all of these to a transparency log, uh, which is this type of system that lets them log uh, the exact tags and versions of all the Go modules um, to the source code. So if you and I both install the same version of a package, we can be, uh, be very sure that we get the same source code. Um, that's something that's just started rolling out. It's similar to the certificate transparency program um, that's used to secure uh, the way that SSL certificates get issued. Um, but that type of thing uh, should be used by pretty much every package manager. And then the final piece, uh, CD reporting. So this is how we report things that we do find. Uh, this uh, process is still very manual and humans are actually still manual. Like you have to email someone usually or fill out a form to get a CD number, uh, which was great back when we were talking about operating system packages uh, that you have uh, maybe a dozen or so installed on your computer. Uh, but language package managers where there's um, hundreds of thousands of packages being uploaded, it uh, doesn't really scale to that process. So uh, there's going to improve uh, the scalability of CV reporting so that it will scale uh, to this open source world where uh, there are way more packages than anyone's ever dealt with before. Some other cool stuff happening. Um, programming language improvements. A um, bunch of kind of the research uh, level here is not as far along, um, but making it possible to apply permissions sort of the Android App Store at a dependency level um, within a larger program. So if you want to install something you don't really trust so much, uh, today you're giving that uh, the same permissions that the rest of your program runs with. Imagine if you can kind of sandbox that dependency and say that's not allowed to access the file system, that's not allowed to access the network. I'm sure, I trust it to do some basic uh, computation. Um, there's also just general hygiene improvements, the boring stuff I talked about before, turning on two factor authentication, signing commits, signing packages, all these things that everyone knows are good, uh, but aren't necessarily taking the time to do. You do enforce that, make that stuff easier, and generally. Uh, increase the adoption of stuff that already exists. And I talked about CDs on the last slide. All right, now I'll end uh, with a couple links to how you can get involved um, and help out, and then we can go to questions. Um, overall summary here, uh, supply chain attacks are a serious problem for open source software and software in general. I scared everybody a little bit, I'm gonna convince them of that. Um, and this is a standards automation and big data problem that we can all solve together if we try. Um, there's kind of a link here for a uh, supply chain security project in the Tecton CD open source project that I'm currently working on, where you can see some information um, and reach out and get involved if you want to. And some contact information for me um, as well as you can follow up after. Uh, here is my GitHub account. Uh, where you can find that little crypto miner code, both of you don't take that running, um, and then my Twitter and um, any languages that are standouts in their supply chain support. Um, from a security perspective, um, yeah, I would say um, I think Go is probably done the most with the transparency log stuff that they've done um, to make the certain classes of attacks harder. Um, I think language package managers in general are all pretty far behind things like operating system package managers that have been at this for a lot longer. Um, but those kind of have the benefit of a 
usually be set up by and run where only a core team has access to publish those packages. Um, and you know, they don't have to deal with the scale of thousands of people uploading stuff constantly. I think um, kind of learning from light layers, uh, learning from the operating system, package managers, and integrating the basic stuff like signatures and some of the system, um, TUF or the update framework um, has come up with uh, on other classes of attacks that need to be prevented with those uh, update notification prevention attacks I mentioned before. How helpful would virus tool be in this area? Um, the virus that approach the register not to be weak. Yeah, I think um, I, I kind of classify that as like a dependency scanner. Um, they're pretty good at picking up um, known CVEs and dependencies and kind of dining you to um, update or upgrade. Uh, GitHub is, um, has some of that baked in now, or if you're using certain languages, it'll uh, notify you if there's a security update you need to pick up. But the challenge there is how few of them are actually reported uh, and how long it takes to get them reported in the CVEs file. 